Our cities and surroundings are filled with many fascinating details that are affected by the natural forces of Earth. Metal oxidation, peeled layers of paint, the browning at the tips of our greenery are just a few examples of how the concept of aging manifests itself. I find these natural forces fascinating and love the effects it has on everything. In this video, I explore the layers of aging in the process of patine steel. Awkwardly enough, my designer wanted me to paint a steel I-beam to look like itself. You'd think he'd want to strip the existing paint to reveal its natural state. Instead, he wanted me to paint it to match the surrounding I-beams in the apartment. I'll probably never be asked to do such a thing ever again. However, matching surrounding objects in an apartment is the best practice to better color matching skills, explore various layer techniques, and have a good time doing it. As always, protect surrounding area. Burnish and seal the tape with varnish to assure crisp edges. I chose a deep earthy red for the base, not a metallic, and added a medium aggregate and joint compound to the mix. This gives the base body and texture that will help mimic the feel. With a large staining brush, stipple your base on with a medium texture covering 100% of the surface. When the texture is roughly 25% dry and still soft, take a plastic blade and flatten it in a circular motion. You want to purposefully create scratches to mimic a grinding or circular sander effect. Remember, we are not painting raw steel look. We are matching the rust and oxidation of steel, so little to zero metallic color is necessary in this finish. With the first glaze, I use Golden's Proceed Glaze Medium plus Golden Acrylic Glazing Liquid, flat varnish for durability, adhesion, and faster cure. I take raw umber, diarylide yellow, ultramarine blue, primary magenta, and titanium white mixed together for a medium, and then I tweak with those colors. Later I add carbon black to gray and darken, and then I check my mix. And then I match my existing mix that I had made when I made my sample, and then to do so, I keep checking the color and I tweak a bit more before I'm ready to glaze. I use a glazing brush to apply a healthy amount of the first glaze over the surface. You need to work quickly here because there are additional steps while the glaze is wet. Prior to glazing, have a separate container of the glaze mix and take a palette or a lid set up with black and raw umber with a different brush. You do not want to find these items while glazing because the surface may dry on you. Dip into a separate container of the master glaze and mix with colors on a palette and apply it in areas you want darker locations. Come back with a wet sea sponge to create lighter and darker areas on the surface. You can use a spray bottle to add drips or use excess water from the sponge to achieve a similar effect. This first step will take time to dry, but since the following two steps require spatter technique, you don't have to wait. With equal parts acrylic glazing liquid to water, mix a golden cream off-white color. Even though I used a metallic champagne color with white, it doesn't matter. Then take a large glazing brush and tightly wrap tape close to the tip of the brush. You want little spacing between bristles so it will have more spring when you flick your fingers through it. Note, masking tape ended up working better than the blue tape. Some people are accustomed to using a toothbrush for spattering, but for large surfaces you want more control and more volume. The larger brush creates tiny to large spatter fragments. You can certainly combine the two. As a side note, taking breaks and using both hands is necessary because you need a lot of spatter in two different colors. The important factor is to make it look organic and realistic. The second color is the brighter rust color. Mix equal parts acrylic glazing liquid to water with diarylide yellow and primary magenta and then add titanium white to lighten it. This one requires a higher concentration of pigment, so add accordingly. Also, be sure to mix enough of this color for the oxidizing drip effect for later. This technique is exactly the same as the previous step, but I tended to spatter more of this color since it gave more characteristic to the finish than the off-white. These spatter fragments will eventually get buried, but are very important to the overall finish. I am glazing again with the original master glaze with no additional colors added from a palette. However, the technique is different. Here I am pouring the glaze onto my palette, dipping my sponge, and applying it to the surface in various areas on the beam. This is what we call a positive technique. 
where you add glaze to the surface with the sponge rather than remove glaze with the wet sponge as we did in the first step of glazing. That technique was a negative technique. I want to cover about 85% of the surface or thereabouts to give color variation. This next step is a two-part oxidation glazing technique. The first glaze is a master glaze plus diarealide yellow, ultramarine blue, and a bit of pearl iridescence for shimmer. The second is one part flat varnish, two parts water, raw sienna, yellow ochre, and raw umber. As I pour the two parts onto my lid, notice the difference in viscosity. The first part is the base glaze, and the second part is more of a lighter blending tone to add variation. Again, I utilize the positive sponging technique, adding the first part throughout the surface. Later, I pick up a bit of the second color on my sponge and blend that color in areas I want to be a bit lighter and less red-centric. These two colors are in the yellowish-green hue, which is complementary to the brick-red stipple base paint. Understanding the color wheel and how to cancel a color out with its complementary color is absolutely necessary. Remember that bright orange oxidation color I said we'd come back to? Well, we are going to use this as the rust or iron drip that seeps through old piping. It is very bright, but we will dilute this with a spray bottle filled with isopropyl alcohol and water. Take a small but coarse brush and run a line of the orange across the top or near the tape, and then use the spray to create actual running drips along the surface. You can control the intensity of the drip with the amount of spray, and you can always add to the running drip as it runs downward. This step really ties the finish together and makes it look realistic. However, be sure to keep it transparent to make it as subtle and effective as possible. Do you also see the importance of burnishing and sealing your tape in the very beginning? Without those small details, you would have a mess under that tape when you remove it. These final two steps were only done on one side of the beam in the living room to mirror the I-beam nearest in perspective to that side. The first is another sponging in a color near to raw sienna to tone down the red and purple undercast. The last step is another spray drip technique with the black and raw umber mix to mimic carbon or soot. This entire process of layering glazes is essential in creating depth, composition, and most importantly, matching the proper overall color. The amount of steps is solely up to you and the finish you are matching. These are shots of the final product. I hope you enjoyed. Please subscribe and check out my other videos. Always a big thank you to my brother Ryan, a better painter than me, and a wicked groove master always providing drum tracks for my videos. Cheers. Oh, this is Jane Hyde.